Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another one of our conversations with Marty Ross, MD. Um, to those of you that are coming back again, I'm glad to see you here. I see many familiar faces here tonight. I um, also see some new faces too, in terms of the people that are on our uh, list that are showing up here too. So I'm glad to see everyone here. Um, this is the second time I'm using this webinar service, so I'm still working out some of the kinks um, last week, I learned that it was hard for everyone to see the uh, questions. And so we're going to make a change in terms of how that works uh, for this week. Um, and so what I'm going to do is what I want each person to do is go ahead and write your questions to me. They're not going to show up for everyone, but they are going to come to me. Um, and what I'm going to do as the questions are proposed tonight is I'm going to um, actually do a cut and paste where I'm going to show them on a document on my screen. We'll do a screen share, and the questions will show up in a much bigger way so everyone can look at it at the same time. And we'll see how that goes tonight, OK? Um, so uh, the way that these webinars work, you write the questions. And uh, you basically create the webinar as the attendees. And I'll try to answer all of your questions to the uh, best of my abilities. Sometimes I actually do get stumped. Um, <laughs> so that's just the way it is. I try to do the best I can with these. Uh, I am making a recording of the webinar. And you will get an email link from me that will show up tomorrow um, in your email. Now, the only way you're going to get that email link, though, is if you have um, a given approval to be part of our uh, email list. And so when you signed up either last week or this week for this week's webinar, um, you should have gotten, um, if you're new to our webinar, if you signed up for the first time uh, to this webinar series last week or this week, you would have gotten an email from me through an email service called MailChimp. Make sure that you did give approval to be part of our email list, because if you did not, you will not get any emails from me uh, with a link uh, for this webinar today, OK? Um, so with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So this is going to be my first attempt to try my new way of taking questions here, OK? So let's see here. All right, so. OK, so I'm going to do a screen share here. You're going to see my screen here in just a minute. OK, that's my screen. And let's see here. Let me go ahead and paste up this first question, make that a little bit bigger for everyone to see. OK, so this is a question from Trish. So let's see, after several documented tick bites over the years, can you speak to the uncertainty that exists when you test negative for Lyme, but yet have many of the symptoms? If it isn't Lyme causing these health problems, what could it be? Also, would you talk about the use of IV antibiotics to treat chronic Lyme? Okay, so let me go back here. I'm gonna do go back so you can actually see me and I can see you now. Um, well, at least I can see the list of people who are here. So Trish, uh, thank you for that question. And um, it's, a, it's a good question. So about 15 to 20% of the time that people have Lyme, the testing is negative, okay? So I'll say that again, 15 to 20% of the time that somebody has Lyme, uh, we are not able to get a positive testing, all right? So, um, Ultimately, Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis, and we make a decision that somebody has Lyme based on what the symptoms tell us, okay? And so it's very possible that for many people with Lyme, again, the testing will be negative. All right, so there's four things we consider making a diagnosis. Number one, what's the risk of getting the infection, all right? So for instance, people that um, have a known tick bite, um, they're a little bit of a higher risk than people that don't remember a tick bite. Uh, people that have a tick bite in New Jersey, where almost 100% of the ticks carry Lyme, have a high probability of getting Lyme, all right? But we also look to see, are you a deer hunter or are you a person that has deer in your yard, all right? But keep in mind that 50% of the time that somebody has Lyme, they don't remember a tick bite. So it's possible to have Lyme and not have a tick bite too, okay? Next thing we consider is what do the symptoms tell us? And have all other reasonable causes for those symptoms been considered and ruled out. In other words, have they been shown not to really be a problem? Third thing we consider is what do the physical exam findings show us? And frankly, most people with Lyme uh, don't have many physical exam findings, okay? 
And then the fourth thing we consider is, do we have supportive uh, blood testing? Okay, now notice how I said that. I said supportive blood testing. So it doesn't mean that a test diagnoses Lyme. A test doesn't diagnose any condition. We, uh, we have to put our, um, our thinking hats on, if you will, and say, does this make sense? Because uh, testing can be wrong. Sometimes you can have false positive tests, and sometimes you can have false negative tests, okay? So let me show you. I'm going to do a quick screen share. Well, I'm going to do a screen share here in a minute because there's a more detailed article that I want to show you that you can take a look at later on your own. Uh, in our online treat line book that will give you even more detail uh, than what I just uh, used to explain the situation for you, okay? So um, let me see, I think there was a second part to your question. Let's see, also would you talk about the use of IV antibiotics to treat chronic Lyme? Okay, so regarding um, antibiotics, uh, in terms of how we treat Lyme, we, we can use oral or we can use IV antibiotics, all right? And when we look at um, antibiotics, in my experience, what I find is that about 85 to 90% of the time that somebody has Lyme, even if they have pretty severe neurologic Lyme, uh, we are able to treat it with oral antibiotics, okay? And so that's 85 to 90% of the time. Now, IV antibiotics will help a little bit better. So if you're doing IV antibiotics, I think the chances that I see of getting well are about 90 to 95%. So we get a 5% increased chance. Um, but you carry increased risk by doing the IV antibiotics. One is financial risk. It's quite expensive, actually. Secondly, um, having that IV line in your arm, because it's something called a pick line. It goes right here in your biceps muscle, or sometimes we'll put an IV line up here in your chest. And those lines have to be left in place. And they have a 15% risk that over a six-month period of time, there's going to be a problem. And the problem can be either that you get a blood clot that forms on that IV line or you get an infection in your bloodstream, okay? So to, um, there's risk that we have to consider in doing IVs. And I don't think the added 5% benefit is worth the risk of getting infection or a blood clot formation, except if somebody has a severe Lyme or Lyme that is not responding to antibiotics, okay? So... If I've got somebody I've been treating with orals and we're maybe six months or so into treatment, I might start wondering about changing over to IV antibiotics, okay? The other times that I will consider doing IV antibiotics pretty early in the treatment, <clears throat> within the first month or two, would be for somebody that has multiple sclerosis Lyme, that's Lyme that's uh, causing multiple sclerosis, or somebody that has Parkinson's Lyme, or somebody that has just really severe neurologic condition, okay, where they're not able to use an arm and a leg, for instance, or limbs, for instance, okay. I also might consider doing IV antibiotics pretty well quickly upfront in somebody that has heart disease uh, related to having Lyme too. So those are the situations that I might consider doing uh, IVs uh, pretty early in the treatment. All right, now I wanna do a quick screen share here. And let's see. All right, so I'm going back to the treat line book. This is the treat line book, okay? And I'm going to do a search here um, just to show you this is how you can use our, one of the ways that you can navigate through our book. All right, and so um, what I want to show you, we're going to look at an article. It's called How to Diagnose Lyme. All right. And there it is. This is our article about how to diagnose chronic Lyme. It's actually a video article, okay? So you can play this. It's about a 30-minute article, I believe. I really get into a lot of depth here. So I'd take a look at this and see if this is something that would work for you, okay? All right, let me go back here and stop this screen sharing. There we go. Okay, so I'm back here again. All right, so thank you for that question, Trish. Um, all right, let's see here. Somebody's, somebody named Kelly said hi. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> I'm not going to post that. Um, all right. Next question is from Derek. Let me go ahead and get this uh, posted up for you here, everyone. Okay, so. All right. So hold on here just a minute. I'm going to get his question posted. Okay, so 
All right, Derek, hello. Let's see, are low platelets common in Lyme? What exactly causes it and how can you correct it? Thanks. Okay, so let's go back here again. Okay, so Derek, um, having low platelets is not common in Lyme, although it can happen. Um, part, for some people, the Lyme infection itself can uh, result in the bone marrow, which is the uh, a blood cell factory found in every one of our cells. For some people, the bone marrow just doesn't work well when you have a chronic Lyme infection. And part of that may be even an autoimmune illness where Lyme triggers um, a situation where the immune system actually acts against um, the functioning of uh, um, the functioning of the, the bone marrow, okay? And so um, that can be one of the problems, all right? Second thing that can happen though is that when you're being treated for Lyme, um, the antibiotics that we use and the herbal antimicrobials that we use um, can at times um, suppress the bone, uh, the bone marrow so that the blood cell factory, the platelet factory, the bone marrow that's found in the, the center of our bones may not work so well, okay? So, um, so the solution is if you develop low platelets while you're undergoing treatment, your doctor may want to evaluate uh, stopping some of the antibiotics. There are some that we think have a greater chance of suppressing the bone marrow than others, for instance. So, for instance, the tetracyclines like doxycycline and minocycline have a little bit better or an increased rate of bone marrow suppression compared to the IV antibiotic ceftriaxone, for instance, okay? The other thing is I also see another antibiotic we use in treating Lyme, especially Bartonella, um, something called Bactrim, which is a sulfa antibiotic, um, we'll also see that that sometimes can suppress the bone marrow too. So if you've got low platelets, um, your provider may want to take a look at the medications you're using, okay? But again, there are some people that I, that I treat that have low platelets um, caused by Lyme due to an autoimmune illness caused by Lyme. And in that situation, treating the Lyme is the actual way to go, okay? The other thing that a person may want to consider initially if they do have low platelets and it's thought to be due to an autoimmune problem, which is um, uh, one, of the, one of the autoimmune problems is something called idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. <laughs> it's a long name. Or we call it ITP. It means there's an autoimmune condition uh, suppressing or attacking the platelets, okay? But if you're a person that has an autoimmune problem, one of the things that you could try is a treatment called low-dose naltrexone, okay? So low-dose naltrexone, everyone, is, a, um, um, is quite useful, actually, if somebody has an autoimmune component to their Lyme, all right? So what do I mean by autoimmune? Well, I mean the immune system, instead of being suppressed uh, in terms of not working well to get rid of the germ, um, there's another thing that can happen with the immune system is that it actually starts to attack. It causes the problem, okay? So for some people with chronic Lyme, when they're not getting better, perhaps the infectious disease doctors are right in thinking that some of this is due to autoimmune illness, where by having a Lyme infection in a person, the immune system starts perpetuating the problem, actually acts against the body, okay? Now, that's what the infectious disease doctors think Lyme disease is, okay? Now, I think they're wrong. I do not think that's the case for most people, but for some people, what is left when they're not getting better with antibiotics? For some people, one of the things that may be happening is the immune system is overacting, okay, is turned against the body, all right? So that's one reason to consider doing something called low-dose naltrexone. Another thing that can happen from an autoimmune standpoint, though, is that as a result of having Lyme, you can trigger separate autoimmune conditions. So for instance, a person with Lyme might have an autoimmune illness called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where the immune system turns against the thyroid. Um, or they might develop rheumatoid arthritis, where Lyme triggers the development of rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Or Lyme might trigger the autoimmune part of what is multiple sclerosis, for instance, okay? Um, or Lyme might trigger something called ulcerative colitis, which is inflammation of the intestine lining, all right? So there are specific autoimmune conditions, too, that are recognized for all kinds of illnesses that can happen in Lyme, too, all right? So if you're considering if you have an autoimmune component to the Ill your illness, what you could consider doing is working with naltrexone. All right, so let's talk about low-dose naltrexone. 
So notice the words I say low dose, okay? So naltrexone is a drug that is made in a 20 milligram pill. And when we use it for people with autoimmune illnesses, we actually use it anywhere from 1.5 to 4.5 milligrams taken one time a day. That's, what, that's why we call it low dose, okay? It's not being given in the full strength. Now what naltrexone is, um, is that it is a uh, medicine a prescription medicine that blocks narcotic receptors in our bodies. And we have natural narcotic receptors called endorphin receptors. And our body has a natural pain system called endorphins, okay? So endorphins are what our bodies make to deal with uh, pain, but also endorphins regulate the immune system. That's another function that they have. Now, if we block the endorphin sites that are found throughout our body, the endorphin receptors, um, our brain that regulates endorphins does not like that. And what it does is it sends out signals for more endorphins to be made. So suddenly there's tons of endorphins flying around the body um, in greater numbers than they normally might be there. And those excess endorphins then, when the naltrexone wears off, will rush and bind, will flood those endorphin sites. And when you flood the endorphin sites, you get a re-regulation of an overactive immune system, okay? You get a modulation so that overactive immune system turns down. So this can help people that have an autoimmune part of their line. So I've seen it. So there's research that shows that it does help with uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It helps with an autoimmune condition called Crohn's disease. Um, it helps with fibromyalgia actually, and there's research that shows it does help with multiple sclerosis, okay? And then I do see it give some benefit in people that are not getting better with their Lyme for any other reason. I might try low-dose naltrexone perhaps about six to nine months into a treatment on a person that's not getting better just to see if we get some benefit from it, okay? To see if that might indicate an autoimmune component to their illness because it really isn't a good blood test for that. All right. All right. Now, why do we call it, what happens with low dose naltrexone? Okay. So again, naltrexone comes as a 20 milligram pill, but we use 1.5 to 4.5 milligrams. When you use that small amount, the endorphin sites are blocked for maybe about six hours or so. Okay. If you used a 20 milligram pill, those endorphin sites would be blocked for about 24 hours and you would never get them unblocked. They would never get flooded with all of those extra endorphins that get produced when those sites are blocked, okay? All right, so that's the principle of low-dose naltrexone. Now, some of my colleagues use it um, for people that have immune suppression in Lyme. I don't find it helpful that way. The only people I see that get benefit from it are people that have obvious autoimmune conditions like the thyroiditis I talked about, like rheumatoid arthritis, okay? And occasionally I will see a person get benefit when they're like a year, two years into the Lyme treatment and they're not getting better. Um, I start wondering if one of the reasons they're not getting better is an autoimmune illness uh, triggered by Lyme and then I'll try low dose naltrexone too. I see it helps maybe about five, maybe 10% of the time. I don't think it has the greatest chance of helping, but it is something that I will try, okay? So I wanna do a quick screen share here to show you a couple things that you might wanna look at later, okay? So let's go ahead and do the screen share here. Okay, there we are. Okay, so we're back in the treat line book, okay? And I'm just gonna do a quick search here again. That's our search function. All right, so what I'm gonna be searching for is low dose naltrexone. Okay, this is our article on low dose naltrexone. Take a look through it. It might be a little bit more concise than I was. <laughs> well, I have to see. Um, sometimes I write a little more clearly than I actually do my uh, verbal presentation, okay? So take a look at this. It talks about the various conditions that get helped by low-dose naltrexone, et cetera, okay? All right, now, in terms of, um, actually, I'm just looking here. Okay, so it does list here what I wanted it to. Okay, now the other thing that I wanna show you is I've talked about, I was just talking about um, that this is something I try in people that are not getting better with their chronic Lyme when nothing else is working um, at about six months and beyond, okay? So there's a whole chapter you all might wanna take a look at later that's called Can't Get Better, Do This. 
this is the chapter you should look at if the normal things that you're doing for Lyme are not helping you. These are the things to consider if you are not getting better in your treatment, okay? You can, you can take a look at this later, but what you're gonna see is one of the articles that we have in here is about using low-dose naltrexone. Where are we here? Somewhere here it is. Uh, there it is, I put the low-dose naltrexone article here, okay? So take a look at this chapter. You're gonna find some helpful things to consider at about six to nine months and beyond if you are not getting better, all right? Okay, so De um, there you go, <laughs> Derek. That's kind of a long-winded response to your question, okay? But I wanted to let you know that, yeah, there can be autoimmune components, and I wanted to describe to everyone what to do with the autoimmune components. And again, Derek, make sure that your doctor takes a look at um, um, your medicines to make sure there isn't something else suppressing those platelets as well, too, okay? All right, let's go back here, everyone. Okay, so we're back here again. Let's see here. Who's got the next question here? So Derek, thank you for that. All right, so I'm gonna take a question next from Leslie. So let's go ahead and a screen share again just so I can post that question for everyone to see. All right, so let's see here. Okay, so here's the question from Leslie. Um, thank you again, Dr. Ross, for all of your wonderful advice. I just finished five months of artemisinin. The last three months at 15 pills per day for, your, for three days as per your instructions. I still have some lingering symptoms of Babesia. Should I continue another month or just go on from here? Also, do you have an opinion about using THC-free CBD oil for detoxing Lyme? Thanks as usual. All right, Leslie, thank you for that question. And I'll, I'll try to hit both parts here. Okay, so I'm gonna go back here again, stop this screen share. All right, so everyone, Leslie's got a good question. Um, as I know, all of your questions are good questions, actually. I usually don't see a, a bad one here, but Leslie, this is a good one too. Um, so thank you for your question. All right, so what Leslie's talking about is a treatment that um, I recommend and that Dr. Tara Brook, my uh, practice partner, my wife, um, yes, everyone, she is my wife, you may not know that, but um, that she recommends and I recommend for treating Babesia, and that's to use the herb artemisinin. Okay, so artemisinin is also known as Chinese wormwood. Um, I'd like to have people take it for three days in a row and then they're off of it for 11 days. And I have people, it's a 100 milligram pill, I recommend that people take it initially at three pills, three times a day for three days on, followed by 11 days off. If that doesn't knock a person down with more significant fatigue or more air hunger or more headaches or more anxiety, then the next time they take it, I advise they go up to four pills three times a day for three days on, 11 days off. And if you can tolerate that, then finally you work up to five pills three times a day for three days on, 11 days off, okay? That's quite an effective Babesia treatment. It works about 75 to 80% of the time. I call it a tier two treatment. There are some prescription antibiotics that do work better. I put those in tier one. I'll show you what those treatments are here in a minute, okay? But um, artemisinin is a good tier two treatment and works about 75 to 80% of the time, all right? Now, how do you know it's working? Well, you gotta look at what your Babesia symptoms are to start with and see if they're getting better, all right? So common Babesia symptoms that people have are drenching night sweats. They may have anxiety, which would be panic attack anxiety. They may have air hunger, feeling like they can't get enough air in at times. Um, they may have racing or skipping of the heart. They may have headaches in the front of their head. Um, and a very peculiar um, symptom that some people have is that they have um, uh, uh, frequent deja vu experiences. That's actually tends to be one of my uh, more favorite um, but very odd um, symptoms that people have uh, when they have uh, Babesia. Now, in terms of do you have to have all those symptoms to have Babesia? No, but um, those are the symptoms you might follow to see if you're getting better, okay? Now, if you're not all the way better and you're about five months into treatment, so an average treatment length that I recommend for most people with Babesia is five months. 
Um, that seems to be the length of time that we need to treat so that we don't get a relapse, okay? And it's based on um, treating beyond the, uh, the life cycle of red blood cells. So Babesia is a parasite that lives in red blood cells. We want to make sure that all the red blood cells are um, covered uh, with the artemisinin, all right? And an average red blood cell lasts about three months after it's been made to four months, all right? So I like to make sure the bone marrow is bathed with an anti-Babesia medication so that even the new red blood cells cannot be seeded, cannot be repopulated with Babesia from the rest of the blood cells. So I like to treat for at least over one uh, life cycle of red blood cells, which is three to four months, okay? That's how I choose five months, all right? Now, not everyone gets better by five months. So if the artemisinin has been working with you and you have a significant reduction, Leslie, what I would keep doing actually is just keep using the artemisinin, keep using it until your treatment um, gets better or until the symptoms go away, okay? Now, the other thing you can consider doing is adding to the artemisinin. And one of the things you might add is the herb called cryptolepis. Um, I like using it mixed with a variety of other herbs and a product um, that is called Crypto Plus. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll tell you who makes that. That's made by a company called Research Nutritionals. I find it better than the normal cryptolepis that is out there. But cryptolepis is an anti-malaria herb that comes to us out of Ghana. It also works about 75 to 80 percent of the time. And I'm finding if I want to work herbally with people, sometimes mixing the artemisinin and the cryptolepis together. If you're to do the cryptolepis, the crypto plus, you would wind up using it as five milli, I'm sorry, four milliliters uh, of this specific product, the crypto plus four milliliters um, two times a day. OK, that's how I like to use that. And you might add that in, um, but I would stay with the artemisinin as part of your treatment. It seems like it is working from what you just wrote to me, okay? All right, let me see. You had a second part of your question. Um, okay, second part of your question. Oh, well, let me, actually, I'm not going to do a screen share yet. I'm going to do a screen share here in a minute to show you the Babesia article. But regarding CBD oil, so everyone in the, most of us, uh, some of us live in states with medicinal marijuana laws, and there is a type of marijuana that we can have our patients get, okay? And that's something called CBD oil, all right? So CBD oil is a, a, comes from parts of the marijuana plant. Specifically, it comes from the stems and it comes from the leaves. It does not come from the flower or bud part of the marijuana plant, okay? The flower part is the thing that people smoke, okay? And that is uh, that's what people call bud or is the marijuana. That's rich in a group of chemicals called THCs. The THCs are what give you the high, okay? They would also have a lot of the bad side effects of marijuana too. CBD oil, on the other hand, has limited amounts of THC, so you tend not to get high on it. I like using CBD oil to help with the side effects, the effects of Lyme like. Um, it can help with pain. It can help with nausea. It can sometimes help with sleep, okay? Now, I know a number of people out there purport or believe or write about that they think it is killing their Lyme and that it's helping with detox. I don't think it helps with any of those, okay? Um, I think it is mainly useful for symptoms, but I don't think it is useful for actually getting at some of the underlying problems that develop in Lyme, like um, detox issues or um, in terms of, I don't think it's actually something that is useful for killing Lyme um, either. All right. Um, so thank you for that question. Let me just do a quick screen share here. All right. So, okay. So we're back here in the Treat Lyme book again. I'm going to go ahead and do another search here. Okay, so the article that I want you to take a look at, and you can take a look at later, is our article called uh, Kills Babesia, A Brief Guide. Okay, this is it here. And what I wanted to say a few things about treating Babesia. Okay, so one of the things that you also ought to make sure, um, Leslie, is that you're doing everything you can to boost your immune system. 
because treating Bambesia requires more than your germ killers. You actually have to boost the immune system too. So to do that, make sure you're following all the steps, the first nine steps in the successful treatment recipe. Okay, that's our Lyme disease treatment protocol. It involves things like getting sleep, for instance, lowering inflammation chemicals called cytokines. Look through here, you'll see all the steps, okay? The other thing you wanna do um, that I find helpful is to use combinations. So for instance, the reason I'm telling you to add in the um, cryptolepis to the artemisin and is using combination seems to work better, okay? And then there's the tier one treatments, okay? And these are things that work 85% of the time. For that, I like basing my treatments either on a combination of atovaquone and proconil, most commonly known as a malarone. I usually like to combine that with one of these medications, okay? Zithromax, Biax, and Doxy or Minnow. And sometimes if that's not working well enough, I may add in some Bactrim, okay? Another tier one approach I like to use is Atovaquone. Atovaquone is Mepron, all right? And um, you can combine that. You can use it as one teaspoon twice a day or two teaspoons twice a day. Again, combine it with Zithromax or Biax or Doxycycline or Menocycline. Those aren't working well enough. Sometimes I'll add in Bactrim into that mix too, okay? And then... <coughs> Here's the tier two treatments I was talking about. These work 75 to 80% of the time. This is the artemisinin that I was just explaining to Leslie, okay? There's also a prescription medicine I'll put in here called Larium. Uh, Larium, I don't you like to use that much because side effect of psych issues that can happen with it. Um, and also it's not quite as effective as the atovaquone uh, combinations I mentioned earlier, okay? The other herb I like using in this is the cryptolepis. And again, I like using it as a combination product where there is uh, lomadium with it um, um, and some of these other herbs that I'm just circling here, okay? And then another prescription antibiotic I put in tier two is coartum. Um, and talk about how to do it here. Four pills, uh, two times a day for three days. Usually I'll have people do this um, twice a month, okay? And again, this is called coartum. I... I find mixed results with it. I put it in my tier two. All right, then tier three um, are some other medications that you might work. They work about 75 to 85% of the time. And I call these the if everything else fails approaches, okay? One of those is to use a drug called Alinea, and you would take it as one pill two times a day. The reason I put it as a tier three drug is it's really expensive. It can run almost $1,400 a month and insurance will not pay for it. They're gonna call it experimental, all right? Another treatment that you could use if everything else isn't working, prescription is clindamycin and hydroxychloroquine, which is a quinine-like medicine. This is kind of an old, old-time treatment before we had the modern um, uh, medicines that we use to treat Babesia. The reason I don't use it that often, it works pretty well, but there's a lot of side effect problems that people can have on this. Um, and um, specifically, they can get into neurologic problems. Um, also, there's abdominal pain, diarrhea. Sometimes this is an easy medicine actually to get overgrowth of something called Clostridium difficile, okay? And then finally, one last thing about Babesia. Um, sometimes if I've got a person that has a Babesia relapse, because 5% uh, of people can get Babesia relapse, if they do, I'm going to want to leave them on a medication the next time we treat to prevent that. And for that, my favorite is malarone, one pill a day. But sometimes I will also use the cryptolepis that I described here and also the artemisinin, okay? So you can take a look a bit more tomorrow at the specific dosing, but that's kind of a walkthrough of how you would wind up treating Babesia, all right? All right, let's go back here again. Okay, so Leslie, thank you for that question. Um, and I do hope that gives you the answer that you were looking for there. All right, let's see here. Um, let me get rid of that. That one too. All right, so let's go on to the next question. And this one is a question from Kelly. Uh, let me go ahead and um, we're gonna do a screen share again here so I can post that question for everyone to see. All right. Okay, so. Hmm. 
Bear with me here. Huh. I'm not quite sure how that happened, everyone. Let's see if we can get that to show a little bit better for you. Well, I guess we'll just have to do it that way. All right, well, it's not quite showing up centered like I wanted to, and I'm not quite sure why, but anyhow. Okay, so Kel this is Kelly's question. If flagell is being pulsed, do you need to take B12 just on the days you are taking the flagell or every day in order to prevent neuropathy? Thanks so much. Okay. All right, so let's go back here. I'll do a quick screen share again, or I'll stop the screen share so y'all can see. Okay, so... Um, what, Cal what uh, Kelly's writing about is that some people, or one of the risks of using Flagyl, and so everyone, Flagyl is a medication um, that we use in Lyme to treat microscopic cyst Lyme. It also probably treats intracellular Lyme, or it does treat intracellular Lyme. And it does have some ability to break up biofilm too, okay? Um, and so it could be a useful medicine. It can be often a hard medicine to take because often it leaves people uh, with a feeling of being toxic, okay? So that's, un un regrettably, um, that is one of the side effect issues that can happen with it. Another side effect that can happen with it is people can develop neuropathy on it, which would be, look like numbness or tingling or burning pain uh, from the nerves too, all right? Now that is actually not usually due to a B12 problem, actually, Kelly. In my experience, it actually is due to a vitamin B6 problem, all right? And that uh, flagell changes the metabolism of vitamin B6. So, what you can do about that um, is actually to take vitamin B6. And what I usually recommend uh, for B6 is that people take it as a 50 milligram pill or a 100 milligram pill uh, two times a day, okay? So that's how you would wind up doing the, um, excuse me, that's how you would wind up doing the folate. And you take it all the time, I'm sorry, B6, uh, vitamin B6, and you would take it all the time. Uh, the days that you're on flagell and the days that you're off flagell, okay? So everyone, um, just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, when you treat Lyme, we recognize that there are actually three forms of the germ. There's something called a spirochete, and that's the corkscrew-looking thing. Many of you have seen pictures of that on the internet, okay? Another form of the germ um, is that it actually lives um, inside of our cells. It loses its covering. We call that L-form Lyme. And then there's a third form, which is a microscopic cyst form of the germ too, all right? And when we design treatments, we need to use antibiotics that actually treat all three forms of the germ, okay? And so we have to use combinations of antibiotics to do that. I'm gonna just do a very quick screen share here. Um, let's see here, just a minute. Ah. Kelly just wrote, she said she meant B6. Okay, so I got it. You did catch that right then. All right. Okay, so I'm actually just getting ready. I'm going to post another question. I'm getting ready to post another question here uh, when we do our screen share here in a second. So just bear with me for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to do a screen share now. And let's see if that's gonna work okay. Okay, so we're back here in the treat line book, okay? And I'm gonna do uh, so that so that everyone, you can look at this later on your own, but there is an article that we have called uh, Kills Lime Germs, um, a brief antibiotic guide. Okay, and so this is the Kills Lyme Germs, a brief antibiotic guide article. Um, and uh, it talks about the fact that we need to address all three forms of the Lyme germ, okay? And it, it tells you, so you can look through this later, but we need to treat all three forms of the Lyme germ. That's what I was talking about here. In the article, I also describe how the various antibiotics work. And then finally down here, I give you some sample combinations, okay? Now, just quickly so that you know, I think there's other ways that we can treat Lyme besides just using prescriptions. And my favorite herbal protocol is this combination here 
called Otobabark extract in cat's claw. I find it works 85 to 90% of the time, which is the same potential success rate that we see uh, for um, other combination antibiotic or for any two prescription antibiotic combination as well, okay? So the oral antibiotics, as I mentioned earlier tonight, work 85 to 90% of the time. And these two herbs, uh, Otobabark extract and cat's claw, also work with that same kind of effectiveness as well too, okay? All right, so let's see here. Let me get rid of that. And let me go back here. Okay, so this is a question from Josephine. All right, and um, let's see here. Oh, we got to get that to go up here. All right, so this is Josephine's question. And Josephine says, hi, Dr. Ross, do you think ozone therapy has a place in Lyme treatment? Thanks. All right, well, let me go back here. All right, thanks for that question, Josephine. So in terms of does um, ozone therapy have a place in Lyme treatment, I think it's something you could consider doing, but I am not a big fan of it. Um, so let me kind of describe that first, okay? So ozone therapy is a part of a group of treatments that we call the oxidizing medicine treatments or oxidizing agents, all right? So oxidizing agents um, are, um, are, are groups of chemicals um, that when they're made actually can harm membranes, all right? So they can, they can injure the membrane of germs. They might even injure our own cell membranes, which can be the problem here, okay? Oxidizing agents are things like ozone, um, which you can do either rectally or you can do IV. Some people do saunas of it, okay? You can do baths with it if you want to. Um, actually, not, not baths. I don't know how to do it with baths. Um, hydrogen peroxide is another oxidizing agent. Um, and then um, high dose vitamin C is also an oxidizing agent. Okay, yes, I said vitamin C. So low dose vitamin C, um, you know, like a thousand milligrams, 10,000 milligrams, that's an antioxidant. It lowers oxidizing agents. But when you use vitamin C at about 30 to 50 grams, yep, grams, 30 to 50 grams, it acts as an oxidizing agent, okay? And again, oxidizing agents can kill germs by damaging the membranes. There's also some evidence from the literature that oxidizing agents also turn on the immune system, so they can be helpful too. Now, I think oxidizing medicine can be helpful um, over the course of a few treatments. I think it can be helpful. And I think that if you were to do it over the course of a few treatments, you, limit, you have limited chances of harm. However, you just noticed the word I said, harm, okay? My big concern about oxidizing medicine is that in Lyme, we probably would have to use it very frequently, more than a few treatments to help get a person well. And I'm very concerned that it may cause ongoing injury of our tissues beyond even what Lyme does, okay? And especially if I've got a woman that is in reproductive age, um, I do not want her to take these because I am concerned of doing damage to the ovaries, okay? So I'm not a big believer in oxidative medicine because I think there's some risk involved in doing it, all right? So that's one problem. The other issue is that I just don't find it to work that well, all right? You might get some initial help when you have somebody with Lyme disease, but I just generally don't find it to be effective when I have patients that have tried it before. Um, I find it may help about 50 to 60% of the time I think you've got better chances of success using oral antibiotics or using herbal combinations, okay? Um, and I would tend to stay away from it because I think the risk is, uh, is too great. And I also think the chances of it helping over time is actually too limited. So I am not a big believer in oxidative medicine in terms of uh, managing and, uh, and in treating Lyme disease, okay? All right, now you may find other people that are bigger believers than me, okay? One last thing, um, I can't use these medicines except the high-dose vitamin C I can use in Washington State uh, under my uh, medical license, but 
Um, hydrogen peroxide and ozone do not pass the sniff test, if you will, of my medical board. And even though I work in a state where they allow MDs to practice alternative medicines, use alternative medicines, I also have to think of myself as being able to stand in front of them and say, yeah, I gave somebody hydrogen peroxide, or yep, I gave them ozone. And they're going to look and think that doesn't sound safe. Just it doesn't sound safe, okay? Regardless of whether it might be or not. So I'm not. I don't do those here in Washington State at all uh, because I don't think they work. And also, I think it puts my medical license at too great of a risk too. Okay. All right. So that answers your question. Thank you very much for that. All right. So let's see here. Next question is from Deborah. Let me get it here so that we can all see it. Yeah. Let's see here. Okay, so we're back on the question page. And let's get this big enough that you can all see it. Okay, so this is Deborah's question, everyone. And, um, well, let's start, actually, bear with me. I wanna see if I can get it all on the same page here. I think we got it all on the same page. All right, hold on here a minute, let's go back here. All right, so this is from Deborah. Hi, Dr. Ross. As per your protocol, I started Leviquin 500 milligrams per day with doxycycline 200 milligrams two times a day for Lyme Bartonella, which I started three weeks ago. After two weeks, I started having right knee pain, right hip stiffness, upper and lower back stiffness. I stopped three days ago with almost complete resolution. Should I restart, and if so, at what dose, one half, or go to one of your other protocols? I tried the rifampin 300 milligrams with doxy and zithromax and got severe nausea. Could I start with a smaller dose, 150 milligrams, or should I try Biax and Bactrim? Please help. Want to continue treatment. Thanks so much. All right. So, Deborah, thank you for that. Um, let me go ahead and go back here then. Okay, so... Um, that's a good question. So Deborah, let's talk about that. So what Deborah is talking about is um, I have an article that I have written called Kills Bartonella, A Brief Guide. And in there, I lay out some treatment approaches that people with Bartonella can do. And I break them into three different tiers, okay? And tier three um, are the herbal approaches, which generally I find to work about 50% of the time. But I'm always open to reconsidering that. Recently, I've actually started doing some combinations of uh, something called Hutunia, along with a Byron White formula called Abart, and I'll, I'll bring a, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that back to people as I see over time if I'm getting better success than 50% of the time. But generally, for Bartonella, the tier three treatments um, would be a Byron White Abart formula, um, or uh, would be Hutunia. And again, I just I find they individually work 50% of the time. I'm trying to start combining them to see if we get any better benefit. I'll report back, uh, report back on that in future webinars, okay? All right. And then in terms of other treatments, there are what I call tier one treatments, okay? And tier one treatments, um, uh, actually, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just show this to you as we're talking. No, I won't. Yeah, why don't I? I'm going to do a screen share here. And what I'm going to do, we're going to do, um, so we're back in the treat line book. I'm going to show you the article called uh, Kills Bartonella, uh, a brief guide. All right, so bear with me here. There it is. Okay, so this is our Kills Bartonella brief guide, all right? So again, just like with Babesia, when you treat Bartonella, one of the critical things that you need to do is boost the immune system and decrease inflammation by following the steps of the successful treatment recipe, our Lyme disease treatment protocol. These are the key components you should do in any Lyme treatment. I'll show you that here in a second, okay? 
The other thing I find helpful in treating Bartonella is to combine antibiotics together. Usually I find working with two antibiotics is going to give you the best chance of getting over Bartonella. Okay, so my tier one treatments. These are treatments that work um, roughly oh, about 90% of the time, okay? These would be the tier one treatments, okay? One of those groups of treatments are ones that have rifampin in them. That was one of the things that you're on, okay? And so when you use rifampin, I have people use it as a 300 milligram pill, two pills one times a day, and you can combine it with things like Bactrim or doxycycline um, or minocycline or clarithromycin or azithromycin, okay? Now, I think you said in your question, bear with me here, in your question, I think you said you got nausea on that. Yep. Okay, so in terms of, if one of the things you can look at with your rifampin is try to isolate it and see if it was the rifampin that gave you your nausea. The way you would do that is take rifampin by itself and don't take it with these other medicines I recommend, okay? So that's one option that you could look at, okay? The other treatment that she then tried or that you then tried was one of these fluoroquinolone-based treatments, okay? So fluoroquinolones are Leviquin and Cipro. And they work really well too, okay? So the Leviquin, I'm sorry for that noise outside here, everyone. Hopefully that goes away here soon. So Leviquin is the most powerful one here and will work usually in about two to three months. The problem with it is it often can lead to tendonitis, which is what you had happen, okay? And when you get tendonitis, the chances are that you're going to get it again, even when you go back on it. So generally, I'm not going to go back on Leviquin if somebody develops tendonitis because the risk is once you get tendonitis, once you get uh, inflammation of the tendonitis, there's a risk of rupture or breakage of the tendons, okay? So I would look at doing another combination first. You may still ultimately want to consider doing Leviquin in the future, but before you try that, I would look at doing the Bactrim clarithromycin, which is also known as biaxin combination, okay? I would do that first. I think that would be your next approach, okay? Now, if that doesn't work, you have problems with that, then you might try to do the Leviquin combination again, but use magnesium before you do it, okay? Um, if you take magnesium, that often can help prevent or limit the tendonitis that people see when they use Leviquin. And the way you would use your magnesium is to take it as um, probably about 400 to 600 milligrams around bedtime and take another 200 to 300 milligrams, uh, well, around another 200 milligrams in the morning. You're going to have to see if you get diarrhea on that. And if you do, just decrease the dose, okay? Because you might need to go back on the Leviquin at some time. What I would do is start loading yourself with it now. Start taking it now so that if you have to use the Leviquin again, you're already on it. You build up your magnesium stores, okay? Now, one thing you should know about magnesium, do not take it with your clarithromycin. You need to take it at least two hours away because magnesium decreases clarithromycin absorption, okay? And then finally, everyone, a tier two treatment is to use a macrolide, which would be biaxin or Zithromax, along with a tetracycline. These work about 85% of the time. And then as I was just telling you, tier three treatments, I find work maybe 50 to 60% of the time, okay? And then finally, in terms of how long it takes to get over Bartonella, usually four to six months, you're going to follow your Bartonella symptoms. The only thing that maybe works quicker than that is to use your Leviquin, your Levofloxacin and Leviquin. Often you can do a treatment in about two to three months with that, okay? All right. So let me see here, Deborah. Yep, I think that answered your question. And thank you for that question, all right? Let me go back here again. We'll stop our screen share. Okay, so that was Deborah's question, everyone. Thank you for that, Deborah. Okay, let's see here. Next question is from Sue. So let me go ahead and do a quick cut and paste of that one as well, everyone. Okay, so let me get rid of that. Let's do a quick paste here. All right, so Sue's got a little bit of a long question. I may not blow this one up just as much. Let's do it 18. I think you all should be able to read that okay. All right, 
Hello, Sue. Thank you for your question here. Let's see. Is it safe to take glutathione? Oops. I don't know. Did I do my screen share here? I guess I did. Okay. Is it safe to take glutathione and curcumin during pregnancy? Um, what other supplements do you advise to take during pregnancy? And which antibiotics are safe to take? Is there anything that you suggest to do or take to help with a Herx reaction while pregnant? Is it safe to take glutathione and curcumin during pregnancy? What other supplements do you advise to take during pregnancy? And which antibiotics are safe to take? Let's see. <laughs> I think I copied this many times. Um, currently on Omnicept, although not able to take it due to extreme nausea and vomiting. Okay, let me go back here. Thank you for that question. Okay, so um, and Sue, in terms of your question, when it comes to treating a Lyme in pregnancy, one of the goals is to prevent transmission, okay? Another goal can also be to help keep treating you if you happen to have it. Now, when it comes to treating Lyme in pregnancy, one of the things we know about Lyme in pregnancy is that there is a risk um, that if a woman has Lyme and she's not on antibiotics during pregnancy, that she might transmit it to the baby, all right? Now, there's some research that suggests that that can occur 25% of the time, but it's limited numbers of mothers and babies that were actually studied. And this is these are projects that were truly designed as research projects, okay? So 25% according to true research projects, okay? Um, but I think it's, gosh, I, it was a limited number of people who said, it. I'm not remembering off the top of my head what those numbers actually are. Now, in addition to looking at research though, we can also, we're also guided by a pregnancy registry um, that was kept out on the East Coast in the late 80s and through the early 90s. And what happened in this, this was not designed as a research project, but basically women with Lyme had quite a bit of information collected about them, including whether they were treated or not treated for Lyme during their pregnancy and also what happened to the baby after pregnancy. And what that registry shows us is that without antibiotics during pregnancy, the transmission rate uh, for uh, Lyme and in pregnancy is 50%, okay? So that's quite high, obviously. But if a woman was on an antibiotic that is safe to take for the baby and for her during pregnancy, that transmission rate goes down to 0%. Okay. Now, in medicine, there is no such thing as 0%, okay? So there's probably a little bit of a risk, but I think it's, it is nearly 0%. And that's how I counsel uh, uh, patients of mine that do want to get pregnant. I do suggest that they can make it an almost 0% chance, all right? Now, the antibiotics that are safe to take during pregnancy are amoxicillin, cefuroxime, which is called ceftin, Ceftonir, which is the one that you're having problems with, okay, also known as Omnicef, and Zithromax, okay. Now, Zithromax, if you use it, is something that might also prevent the transmission and pregnancy of Bartonella, but there is no science that says that. I will use it as a safety precaution in a patient of mine that has Bartonella um, that hasn't been treated. Um, to make sure that they're, to decrease the chances that we might have transmission of the co-infection Bartonella during pregnancy. But again, I want to let you know, I don't have any science to guide me on that. I'm doing it more as a precaution, okay? Now, any one of those four antibiotics that I just mentioned to you, if you take them during pregnancy, you can decrease the transmission rate to 0%. The way I use amoxicillin is to have a person take 1,000 milligrams three times a day. The cefuroxime, 500 milligrams two times a day. Ceftonir, 300 milligrams two times a day, or Zithromax, 500 milligrams one time a day. Uh, yep, one time a day. Okay, now, if I've got a woman who's not doing well with her Lyme going into pregnancy, I often will have her take um, the Zithromax along with one of those other three antibiotics because Zithromax treats intracellular Lyme. Those other antibiotics of amoxicillin, ceftonir, or um, cefuroxime treat um, spirochete Lyme only, okay? So you get bigger coverage, broader coverage, you will use those two antibiotics, okay? And then I'd like to change the antibiotics about every six months during pregnancy as well too, all right? Now here's a few other things you should know about pregnancy. Um, generally during pregnancy, a woman's health who has Lyme will do better 
all right? And the reason we think that happens is that um, during pregnancy, your immune system is designed to turn down inflammation. So it's a mechanism of protecting the developing baby. So it's very common that a woman that during pregnancy that has Lyme will feel better. The problem though is after pregnancy. After pregnancy, a woman with Lyme often will do worse, primarily I think because of the stress of breastfeeding um, and also of getting not as much sleep and of having to do the day-by-day -day care of a baby, if you will, too, all right? Now, I did mention breastfeeding. Um, after pregnancy, there is a small chance that um, babies can get um, a Lyme through breast milk. There are studies that do show it is in breast milk. Um, however, there are no formal studies that show it is transmitted. There is evidence, though, based upon what I see and some of my colleagues see, that rarely a woman will transmit it through breast milk. So generally, after pregnancy, if you are going to breastfeed, go ahead and do it. There's great benefits of breastfeeding, okay? Um, like bonding with your baby and like uh, transmitting good parts of your immune system to the baby, okay? Uh, your baby, that is. Um, but... Um, probably um, you should be on an antibiotic to limit the chances you might transmit uh, your Lyme to the baby um, while breastfeeding too, okay? So those are just some safety precautions to take, all right? Um, all right, now about the supplements, which is the bigger part of your question here. So there are no safety studies or adequate safety studies that have been done looking at any of the supplements like glutathione, like curcumin, like ashwagandha. Um, and so, unfortunately, if you were to get into a Herx situation during pregnancy, you're kind of stuck, okay? Um, I just, there, I, I do not see the safety studies that have been done to trust using any of those herbs. The safest thing you can do during pregnancy is to be on a prenatal vitamin, uh, which is something that is safe to do. They're made for pregnancy, all right? And then the other thing um, is you do want to work to prevent yeast by being on probiotics. They're still safe to take during pregnancy. And then one last thing that you should do if you are going to be on antibiotics during pregnancy is to take um, the prescription medicine, Nystatin, uh, to prevent yeast. It's a 500,000 international unit pill. You would want to do two pills two times a day. I mean, you would want to take it um, throughout the pregnancy. It stays in the intestines. It is not absorbed into your bloodstream. It has absolutely no toxicity risk to your baby when you take it during pregnancy, okay? All right, so that's a lot that I've just said about Lyme and pregnancy. Um, I do want to do a quick screen share here. Um, actually, hold on here just a minute. I am going to do screen share here just a second. All right, so here comes the screen share. Okay, so we're back in the Treat Lyme book here. Um, I want to do a search here. Okay, so we do have an article, a video, or a, um, a written article on Lyme and pregnancy. Okay, and it's called uh, Lyme and Pregnancy, Will My Baby Get It? What About My Health? Okay, take a look at this later. Again, it's part of the Treat Lyme book. Um, you will need a subscription to read this article. Uh, and again, about the subscriptions, um, yeah, they're worth it, people, uh, or everyone. <laughs> everyone, they're worth it because you get a lot of useful information we have here in the Lyme book. Basically, about everything I'm describing here in the webinar, you can find in a written article here in the Treat Lyme book. Uh, we've got a very comprehensive source of information for you here. So I encourage you um, to subscribe when you're asked if you don't have a subscription and you try to get into an article here that is part of the, the book that requires a subscription, you will be asked to subscribe. And I, I think it'd be a good idea if you would, okay? So this is our article. You're going to see I talk about evidence, transmission risk, and prevention. I give it a little the same kind of detail that I just did in the written explanation, okay? So take a look at that. All right, so let me go back here again. So Sue, thank you for that question. And I think I, I think I just answered most of that. All right, so let's post up the next question here. All right, so this next question is from Alicia. And let me get, get it so you all can see it here. Okay, so Alicia, thank you for posting a question here. Let's see. Hi, I hear that Babesia is almost impossible to eradicate. 
Why do you think that some are able to eradicate why others find it almost impossible to get rid of and are stuck maintaining it through their lives? What's the success rate best methods? Okay, thanks for that question, Alicia. And um, so I'm gonna start answering your question by doing a quick screen share here. I'm gonna keep up this screen share, okay? So I wanna go back here. So one of the key things that I have mentioned a number of times here tonight um, is that in treating Lyme, and in treating uh, Bartonella and in treating Babesia, it's important to do everything you can to boost the immune system, okay? And to look at that, you need to read our successful treatment recipe, all right? We tell you the steps to do here, okay? So you'll find it under our Lyme treatment guidelines. It's this part of the tab up here, all right? So you want to read through this, okay? Now, there's key steps that you need to do as part of your Lyme treatment, and we tell you what they are here, okay? These are all designed to boost your immune system. These are critical. You need to do these throughout your Lyme treatment. Antibiotics alone is not gonna get you over Lyme, all right? Number one, get sleep, because sleep helps your immune system work better, um, decreases inflammation, cytokines, has a whole host of benefits, will even help you with pain, all right? Number two, make sure you're lowering inflammation chemicals that are made a part of Lyme disease. Um, and to do that, you want to use the herb curcumin, all right? We talk about it here. Number three, make sure you're doing an herb that helps boost uh, the function of your body, helps you deal with stress. That's called an adaptogen. We like the herb called ashwagandha, uh, which is an Ayurvedic um, herb, okay? Um, all right, and then the next thing we recommend is make sure you correct hormonal problems. And you can do this on your own, okay, except if you have low thyroid, but you can figure out if you have low hormones and you can do some things to correct that on your own. Down here in this section, if you take a look at the symptoms part, look here to see if you have enough of the symptoms. If you do, correct your adrenals or correct your thyroid, okay? Make sure you're on a good multivitamin. Make sure you treat yeast if you have too many yeast in your intestines. Read through this, we tell you how to do that, okay? Um, number seven, treat your Lyme infection. Number eight, do basic detox, and we tell you how to do that here. Number nine, deal with your co-infections, okay? These first nine steps are critical to help your immune system work well, okay? So as part of treating Babesia, boost your immune system. All right. Okay. Now let me do it. I'm going to stop doing this. All right. So in terms of the rest of that question, um, uh, Alicia is, uh, where are we here? So in terms of treating Babesia, what are the chances that a person can get rid of it? What I see in my practice, it, working the way that I do, working with all of those essential steps in the successful treatment recipe as part of a Babesia treatment, as part of a Lyme treatment, I see that we can eradicate Babesia 95% of the time. That's my experience, okay? There are 5% of people, though, that we do have difficulty, and either they relapse once we're done treating, or uh, we just never get it completely under control. That does happen about 5% of the time. So I, I actually have good success treating Babesia. Um, and so I, I don't agree that it's impossible to eradicate. It is maybe 5% of people, but 95% of people, especially if you do all those steps we just outlined on boosting your immune system, are going to do quite well, okay? And I think earlier tonight, I already showed you uh, the protocol that we have for treating Babesia. Take a look at it. Um, I showed it to everyone earlier tonight, so I'm not going to go back and show that again, okay? Um, now, I just want to do one basic comment here for everyone. Um, so, as you know tonight, I have mentioned a number of times various herbs um, that you can use uh, to help with your Lyme treatment, okay? Um, it used to be that we were able to let you know what those herbs actually are. Um, and uh, we would let you know within our Treat Lyme book, okay? Um, however, uh, we found out that that was a violation of, or there was, there was a group that accused us of being in violation of uh, some of the laws that the Federal Food and Drug Administration has about uh, advertising supplements. And so we decided to take the names down so that we couldn't be accused of advertising those. 
Um, however, the reason we did include those products is that we wanted to make sure that if you were going to get them, that you used high quality ones, all right? So if you're looking for high quality supplements that we use with our existing patients, I'm gonna show you briefly where you can get those. You'll have to search for the actual product you want though, okay? Um, and so let me just do a quick screen share here and I'll show you where we recommend that people get those supplements. Um, at least our patients get those supplements. Okay, and that's here. This is our uh, supplement site. It's called Marty Ross MD and Tara Brook ND Supplements. Um, so for instance, uh, here you will find, you can look through the supplements either by medical problem or by manufacturer. The other thing you can do is you can actually just search for what you're looking for by name, okay? So for instance, um, if you're wanting to find the Otoba Bark extract that we recommend, uh, you just go ahead and type Otoba here. I hope this works since I'm showing you. <laughs> there it is. So Otoba Bark Extract is this uh, Banderol, everyone. That's Otoba Bark Extract, okay? So our, um, our supplement site to find these high quality supplements that we recommend that our existing patients use because they have the best chance of working because they don't include a lot of toxins in them that could harm you um, is found at www.treatlime.com. And that's Marty Ross MD, Tara Brook ND supplements, okay? So if you're looking for a good source for what we're recommending, this is where you would come and get it. All right. All right, so let's go on here. So Alicia, thank you for that question. All right, so let's see here. Got a lot of people still with us here tonight. So it's good to see that people are staying on through this. And actually, I'm feeling a little more comfortable tonight with this new way that I'm posting questions. It works a little bit better than what was happening last time. All right, so Alicia, thank you. I go ahead and post another question up here, everyone. All right, let's see here. Okay, hello, Sue. Thank you for your question here, by the way. Let's see, I started antibiotic treatment for Lyme disease in October 2014. I have been listening to past webinars and doing additional research regarding diet to help relieve the flare-up of symptoms. Uh, both sugar and gluten seem to be the thing to monitor to greatly reduce the growth of yeast and flare-ups. Is there a recommended max amount of grams of sugar to consume per day? Is there a difference between the natural sugars found in fruits as opposed to those added to fruit to foods such as peanut butter? Ah, very good question. Um, so um, let me let me go ahead and do a screen. Let me go back here. Oops. Oh no. Huh. <laughs> I think you all may be able to see me, but I think I just got rid of my webinar page. Let's see here. I hope I'm going to be able to get myself back on. Ah, oh, no. Um, <laughs> this creates a bit of a problem. Hold on here everyone, just a minute. I, I, I lost myself. Let's see here. I apologize. I'll, I'll get back here in just a second. Uh, I hope to get back to everyone here in just a second. Let's see what happens here. All right, well, darn it. This is not working out the way I wanted it to. Um, oh, there it is. I got it, I found it. Let's see here, get rid of that.
Hmm. Aha! There it is. I found it. <laughs> Boy, that was not too good. Um, let's see, where did I put the other things now? There we are. Okay, I'm back here again, everyone. I think I'm back here again. Let me go back here again. There we are. All right. So, let me go. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Major technical problem. I lost my screen. All right, so let me talk about sugar. Um, so I don't actually have, in terms of uh, yeast prevention, um, the amount of sugar that I recommend in terms of grams, for instance, that a person should use to limit their um, sugar, all right? Um, what I do tell people is to avoid simple sugars, which would be things like cookie, candy, cake, ice cream, all right? I do think that fruit juices are not good because that's getting straight sugar. But foods that have sugar that are bound to fiber are okay. So that would be things like your whole grains um, or your beans and legumes or fruits and vegetables, okay? Just not juicing them, okay? Yeah, you are still getting some carbohydrates, but generally for people, that is safe. Now, if I've got somebody, however, though, that I'm doing... Um, telling them to avoid the simple sugars, as I just said, but they can still have fruits and vegetables and their beans and legumes. And if that person is doing probiotics and if that person is during, doing the treatment and they're doing yeast prevention approaches, including Nystatin, which is a prescription medicine, or using herbal combinations like the one I like to use called Phytostan, um, that has P-H-Y-T-O-S-T-A-N, that has some powder co, caprylic acid, rosemary oil, thyme oil um, in it. Um, uh, if I've got a person doing everything they can to prevent having yeast by being on probiotics, by being on an anti-yeast medicine that they just take during the treatment, like the phytostan herb or the prescription nystatin I just described, um, and then they limit simple sugars, if that works, great. However, if that doesn't work, then I might recommend that they even get on a more restrictive diet, like a paleo diet, for instance, okay, uh, where they actually do strip out most things that might even have carbs in them. Um, but beyond that, I guess I can't give you a more specific recommendation based on what your question is here, okay? All right. Uh, sorry about that, Sue. So I, I do hope that gave you some information, though. Okay. Thank you for that. All right, let's see here. All right, let me get this next question, everyone. All right, so I'm gonna do a screen share here again. Okay, let's go back there. Okay, so this is a question from Deborah. And I'll get that bigger here for everyone. Okay. So, hello, Deborah. Let's see, I used to get cold easily and now am heat intolerant. My sense of smell has changed also. What is this, an indicator of Lyme, Bartonella, et cetera? Okay, all right. Um, all right, let me go back here. Okay, so um, all right, so Deborah, in terms of the, the sense of smell, um, Sometimes the sense of smell changing can be a side effect of the antibiotics, for instance, okay? Um, sometimes it can be a neurologic uh, condition where uh, the nerves that are supposed to give you that sense of smell isn't working correctly. We could see that as part of Bartonella, or we could see that as part of Lyme. In terms of um, heat intolerance, 
that sometimes can be part of Babesia, okay? Now, to see if you have Babesia or to see if you have Bartonella, you should take a look at an article that we have on that, okay? And that article um, is an article called, uh, it could be Lyme, or actually it could be Babesia or Bartonella, the signs or symptoms. Let me see if I can find that here for you real quick. That didn't work out right. Let's go back here again. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see here. How is that working? Okay, so, um, okay, so I'm back here. I'm going to go to the treat line book here. And let me search for the article. So the article is called, um, let's see, it could be, I gotta remember what I called it here. Okay, so it's called, it could be Bartonella or Babesi, the symptoms and signs, okay? So take a look through here. Um, you're going to see that I, I'm not a big believer in testing, okay, for these because um, for Bartonella, we estimate 30 strains. For Babesi, we estimate 15 to 20 strains. And for each of those, we really have decent testing for two of those each, all right? So read through the symptoms that we say are Bartonella and the symptoms that we say are Babesia to figure out if you might have Bartonella or Babesia to see if they might be a cause of some of those problems you just wrote to me about, okay? So Bartonella symptoms include day sweats, ongoing anxiety, pain on the soles of the feet, uh, swollen lymph nodes, rash that looks like stretch marks and non-stretch mark areas, uh, cognitive dysfunction, um, neurologic symptoms of numbness or sharp, uh, shooting, stabbing, or burning pain, abdominal pain, bladder symptoms, and sometimes psychiatric symptoms, okay? Babesia symptoms, um, uh, um, Babesia symptoms are things like um, uh, hot flashes, um, drenching night sweats, uh, panic attacks, air hunger, skipping or racing of your heart, a little red spot rashes that look like you've got little broken blood vessels under the skin. That can sometimes be part of Babesia. Um, uh, deja vu, a sense that you have frequent deja vu can be part of Babesia too. And the headaches in the front of your head can be part of Babesia, okay? So I'm not quite sure if I answered that question adequately for you, but uh, those are some things for you to consider, all right? All right, let's see here. Right, so let me just do a quick copy of that. Do a screen share. Okay, so let me go back to our question. Okay, so this is a question from Linda. All right. Hello, Linda. Let's see, my daughter has Lyme and suffers from extreme hypersalivation. Have you seen this with any of your patients? And is there anything that can be done to decrease the salivation? It prevents her from sleeping and her mouth becomes extremely sore from her need to constantly spit it out. Uh, Linda, I'm sorry. I have not seen this at all before. Um, you know, Lyme causes so many different problems and, and how it shows up in each person is completely different. I don't have a good explanation for why this is happening with your daughter. I would consider if she was a patient of mine though, trying something that I would call very experimental. And that is, you know, as I described earlier tonight, one of the things that can happen for people with Lyme is they can develop autoimmune illnesses, okay? So the autoimmune illnesses being um, the immune system triggering problems, okay? And so it is possible, and I'm just coming up with this off the top of my head, it is very possible um, that what is happening with your daughter 
is that she has got an autoimmune condition um, that has been triggered um, by, um, by the Lyme, and maybe that is causing her to salivate too much. So I would experiment. I mean, I'm just coming up with this off the top of my head, but you might experiment trying that low-dose naltrexone uh, that I talked with you, uh, everyone, about earlier tonight. If you missed that, look at it in the recording tomorrow. Also, in the Treat Lyme book, though, you will find a copy um, of that article, okay? So you might want to look at the Treat Lyme book as well, too, okay? All right, so let me see one other thing here. All right, let me see. I'm going to see if I have time for one more question here. So let me just see if there's something that's quick. Let's see. Josephine, you asked me again if I got your question. I did. I answered that already. Uh, unfortunately, I am not seeing anything else that I'm going to be able to do a quick response to here. Um, all right. So everyone, I, I guess I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here tonight. Um, listen, tomorrow I will send out an email to everyone through our MailChimp account, which means that when you signed up last week for the first time, or if this week you signed up for a first time over the last two weeks, you need to make sure that you actually gave permission to be added to our mail list. All right. So you would have gotten an email from me and MailChimp saying, do you want to be part of our email list? You need to say yes. If you did not do that, go back and say yes. Otherwise, I will not be able to communicate with you tomorrow with information about this webinar, including the link um, for the recording. I will have the recording ready um, sometime tomorrow morning uh, before I come to work, hopefully. Um, um, and so you can look for that. You'll get an email about that, OK? Here in a minute, I am going to take you, as we leave the webinar tonight, I'm going to take you to the Treat Lime book, all right? And in fact, what I'm going to be doing is taking you to the Treat Lime book. Uh, I think we'll go to the Treat. I'm trying to decide what page I want to take you to. The Treat Lime book. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, yeah. Okay, we'll take you to the Treat Line book homepage, okay? Um, what you can do from there is you can use it to start navigating around the book by using the chapters list that we have or the search function that we have, okay? And if you're wanting to subscribe, I encourage you to do so. We've got a lot of helpful information in the Treat Line book. It is based upon the same kind of explanations that I gave you here at the webinar tonight. I try to make them extremely understandable. Dr. Brooke and I have decided to write them in a way that are very usable. We give you practical information, almost how-to information, if you will. Um, and if you have not taken this time to subscribe, I encourage you to do so. And also request that you do so if you're getting benefit even from these webinars, because the support you give us gives us more time to develop the articles that we have. And there's a lot more to do. We need to add video to each one of the articles. Um, uh, we've got a limited amount of video out there, but our next step is to start adding video to our articles so they're more usable for people that have uh, difficulty reading or may take in information that way. So please help us so we can keep helping others. When you help us, you're actually helping others as well, too. I encourage you to do that. And then one last thing, um, again, if you're looking for places to get the supplements we recommend that are high quality, take a look at our supplement store, the ones our patients use where they get their supplements. It is Marty Ross MD and Terrabrook ND supplements at www.treatline.com. All right. And finally, tomorrow in that email, I will give you the link that you can sign up for next week's webinar. You can do that already by going to our webinars page at treatline.net, though. But I, would, I hope I can see you all again. As you can see, I think I got the how to answer questions and show them to everybody. Worked out a little bit better than last week. Still working out the kinks with this new email system or this new webinar system, but I'm pretty happy with how it's working, okay? Um, all right, everyone. Oh, and if you're not happy with how it's working, tomorrow when I send you your email, write to me and let me know what the problems are from your end so that I can figure out if there's a way that I can fix it from my end, okay? All right, everyone, I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Here comes the treat line book for you.